I'm going to share a Thanksgiving story with you from John Paris over the hills to Grandpa's house. The first snow began to fall, pure and spinning from a gray goose sky. It was Thanksgiving, and we were on our way to Grandma's and Grandpa's to spend the day. Mama said, the old woman's picking her geese, and Dad said, it's going to be a good day for rabbit hunting. I didn't say anything, not right then, but my mind was on the snow too and the promise it held for a boy of eight going on nine. My thoughts were mostly of Grandpa and Grandpa's sled. Not the great big ox sled, but the little one with the rope pull he used to fetch stove wood from the wood lot for Grandma's kitchen stove. I sure hoped Grandpa would let me take it out to the hill back of the barn where there was a super fine place for riding a sled in the snow. When we reached the last hill before Grandpa's, the day was barely an hour old. The snow was thicker now and the flakes were bigger, and then we were over the hill and there was Grandpa's. Dad ran the Model T under the gnarled old apple tree across the creek from Grandpa's where blue wood smoke curled up from the chimney. I said, I wish it would snow three feet. And Mama said, why, that would be over your head. And I said, I don't care, because then we'd have to spend the night with Grandpa and Grandma. Dad got out and came around the car and unbuttoned the door curtain so Mama and I could get out. The snow was laying on the ground good now. It was beginning to pile up in little drifts. It covered the rocks and lay along the fence rails and filled up the path that wound down to the creek and the footbridge. I scrambled out of the car and made tracks in the white feather bed with my new red top boots. They were the finest boots I had ever owned. There was a pocket stitched on the left one and the pocket held a brand new double bladed Barlow knife. Dad said, here son, you carry the 22. And Mama said, is it loaded? Dad said, of course not. And Mama said, that's what folks always say, and then somebody gets killed. Dad shook his head. He handed me the 22. Then he reached in the back seat and got his shotgun. We set out down the path to the house, Mama leading the way through the snow, me carrying the 22, watching the tracks my boots made in the snow, and Dad following along with his shotgun and sack of things for Grandma and Grandpa. When we got to the house, we found Grandpa sitting by the fire. With him was Uncle Alan and his boys and Uncle Doc and his boy, Bill. Uncle Alan said, if we're going to do any rabbit hunting before dinner, we better get going. And Uncle Doc said, well, let's go now that John's here. Dad said, Pa, you feel like a little rabbit hunting? And Grandpa said, I'll take this fire to rabbit hunting. Then Grandpa patted me and said, me and the boy will stay here. And right away I figured I wasn't going to get to do any sledding. But Grandpa said, we'll find things to do. Maybe get the sled out. Then the men folks gathered up their guns and left, all except Grandpa and me. Mama had gone back to the kitchen where Grandma and the other women folks were getting the dinner ready or sitting around talking and getting in Grandma's way. Grandma wasn't one for letting anybody help her in the kitchen. Usually, she'd shoo everybody out, especially at Thanksgiving or Christmas, for they were the special times she insisted on doing every little thing herself. But Grandma was getting old now, and she wasn't adverse to having the wives and daughters of her sons keep her company and help a little while she supervised the cooking. Grandma wasn't a fancy cook, but nobody ever complained of her food. Grandma preferred fresh backbones and ribs to turkey, for they represented Thanksgiving to her more than turkey, since Grandpa usually did his hog killing around Thanksgiving. Grandpa was mighty fond of backbones and ribs, too, and Grandma liked to please Grandpa more than anything she could think of. But with the children married and fetching their children for Thanksgiving, Grandma went along with turkey on the table. There was turkey for those that favored it and backbones and ribs for her and Grandpa. Of course, no one would have dared not to take a helping of her favorite dish. Now, Grandma's pumpkin pie was something to set somebody's mouth to watering. Into it went a ritual that made for a second and even a third helping. 
Mama always said Grandma spent more time preparing a pumpkin pie than it took to fix all the rest of the dinner, but she had to admit that nobody else could make a pumpkin pie like Grandma. Grandma prepared her own pumpkin for her pies, no store-bought pumpkin for her. She wasn't one for stuff out of cans, not like some of her kin who lived in town and put ease above taste. No, sir. Grandma believed in sticking with homegrown and homemade stuff. Maybe that's why everybody loved Grandma's cooking. A heap of folks complained that the way Grandma fixed her pumpkin was a chore, but they agreed she couldn't be beat. When it come time for Thanksgiving, Grandma went to the smokehouse where the pumpkins were piled and went through them and got one that was just right. Grandma said there were all kinds of pumpkins, but that there was only one kind to make pie. She selected it for the thickness of its meat. Once she got her pumpkins picked out, the real work began. She would sit down and peel them and then slice them and cut the slices into small pieces. Once this was done, it was time to cook the pumpkin. Grandma would fill a big pot with little pieces of pumpkin and cook it until it was almost like mush. Then she would drain and strain it to make it smooth. A whole day would go into the process, or longer, depending on how many pies Grandma intended to make. She didn't make just one or two pies, not Grandma. She made pies by the stack, never less than five or six. Grandma also made pumpkin bread. She took pumpkin that had been cooked and strained and mixed it into a batch of cornmeal. She added salt and worked it into a dough and then baked it. Usually she cooked her pumpkin bread on the hearth or on the blade of a hoe. And sometimes she would make molasses butter. While Grandma's Thanksgiving dinner wasn't fancy, it was mighty good eating. Dinner went on the table at noon, and nobody was ever late, not even the rabbit hunters. That's why the family gathered at Grandma and Grandpa's almost before it was daylight. The men folks would get in three or four hours of rabbit hunting and be right there when Grandma announced that dinner was ready. Oh, we would have a big time at Grandma's. Grandpa would see that everybody was seated about the big table, and then he would sit down and bow his head and say grace. Thanksgiving was one time when the children didn't have to wait. It was all family, and Grandma made a place for everybody at the first sitting. On this particular Thanksgiving I'm remembering, Grandma had been cooking for almost a week. She had stacks of apple pies and pumpkin pies and egg custard pies. When the men folks left to go rabbit hunting, I went back to speak to Grandma, and Grandma took me off in the dining room and sneaked me a piece of pumpkin pie. I went back to where Grandpa was, and he winked at me. He knew what Grandma had done. Grandpa said, let you and me go see if we can find that sled. And I said, all right. We found it. It was right out at the barn. Grandpa let me pull the sled, and we started off up the hill back of the barn. Somewhere off across the hills, there was the sound of a gun. The snow dropped, pure and spinning, out of a gray goose sky. So I hope you enjoyed that wonderful remembrance of John Paris about Thanksgiving when he was a boy. John Paris was a writer um, here in Western North Carolina where I live. That's the area that he wrote about. His books are hard to find, but they're wonderful if you can find one. They're out of print, but he, he wrote for many years for the Asheville Citizen. So his books are just all of his articles put into book form, and they are just a joy. So if you can find one, I, I highly suggest you do. John Paris was his name. Now, while he was writing about Thanksgiving in days gone by when he was a boy, and things have totally changed since that time, there are a few of those traditions that are still alive and well in the mountains of Appalachia, in western North Carolina where I live. Certainly, the going to Grandma and Grandpa's. For many years, that's where we all gathered at Pap and, and Granny's, and before that, it was at my grandparents' house, you know, and then the torch kind of passes to the next the next set of grandparents. And we did that for many, many years. Uh, after Pat passed away and Granny kind of got a little more feeble, for the past few years, we've gathered at my house, but still that gathering together with family is still really important. And I know that's important in lots of places, not just Appalachia. Of course, the pumpkin pies, that's important in lots of places along with here in Appalachia. Um, and I love to put up my own pumpkin and make pies with it. I do it a little bit different than John Paris's grandmother, but it's still, I agree, your homegrown pumpkins are just so good when you're making pie or bread with them.
the tradition of hunting on Thanksgiving. That one's still alive and well in my area of Appalachia. There's a lot of people who really only hunt that one day, and it's because of tradition. They don't necessarily go at other times. Of course, there's hunters that go all the time, uh, but that's kind of a tradition where the men folk, like he said, would go on and go out and about and hunt, or maybe they just go outside and kind of talk or, or you know, shoot some guns or whatever while the while the women take care of the festivities inside. So that one's still alive and well too. I kind of think that's interesting that, of course, many things have changed since uh, John Paris was a boy till today, but I love that sense of tradition that some of those things are still alive and well. And like I said, I, know, I understand it's not just in Appalachia, it's in lots of places. But for me and John Paris, we were primarily uh, both talking about Western North Carolina. So I hope you enjoyed the little story. I certainly did, so I hope you did. And I hope you have a wonderful Thanksgiving. And my only advice to you is I'll share is something that Pap used to tell us is don't bust your belly. <laughs>